If you will, turn with me to the Gospel of Leviticus, chapter 25. Leviticus, chapter 25. My subject is Christ, our kinsman redeemer. I preached a message by the same title to the folks at College Grove Friday night, but that message was taken from the book of Ruth, the four chapters in which God the Holy Ghost gives us a historic picture of Christ as our kinsman redeemer by Boaz redeeming Ruth. Here in Leviticus 25, we have the law that God gave concerning the kinsman redeemer of which the book of Ruth is a portrayal. In the Old Testament scriptures, understand as you read the Old Testament scriptures, every law, every commandment, every ordinance, every ceremony, every priest, every garment of the priesthood, all the events that transpired in the history recorded in the Old Testament were brought to pass by God's design to be a picture of Christ and God's salvation in him. And one way or another, they all are designed to point us to the Lord Jesus Christ to show us who he is, what he would accomplish, and how God saves sinners by his free grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this law of the kinsman redeemer is found in Leviticus 25 verses 25 through 55. Remember according to verse 1 of this chapter this law was given at the very time God gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. He gives a law of the kinsman redeemer at the very time he gave those Ten Commandments that curse us all. Those Ten Commandments that announce God's judgment upon all peoples. Those Ten Commandments that expose our sin. So that as he gave the commandments, he gave this law of the kinsman redeemer, giving hope and promise of redemption even for those who are cursed by the law. It is no accident that this law is given in direct connection with the year of Jubilee. It came to pass in God's providence that precisely at the time when the trumpet was to be blown in the year of Jubilee, our Lord Jesus Christ, our kinsman redeemer, died to set us free from the curse of the law, from death and from sin by his accomplished redemption. Now I want to show you something of what this chapter teaches us about our all-glorious Christ, our kinsman redeemer. The Lord Jesus, the Son of God, became our kinsman, our next of kin, our nearest kinsman. He became one of us for one purpose, that he might redeem us for the glory of God. That he might redeem us and make his name famous in Israel. He came here that he might recover our ruin from our father Adam and restore that which we lost in Adam and restore that with an overplus. Restore that which we lost with that in Adam and give us much more besides. Let's read the verses of this passage that specifically deal with the kinsman redeemer. Verse 25. If thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it, and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof, and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the year, uh, in the jubilee, it shall go out, and he shall return unto his possession. Verse 47. And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him 
wax poor and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee or to the stock of the stranger's family. After that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him. Or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him. Or if he be able, he may redeem himself. Now let me show you three things in this picture. First, we'll talk about the redeemed. And then the redeemer. And then thirdly, the redemption. First then, the passage speaks of the redeemed. If one of the Jews had fallen into deep poverty by neglect, by carelessness, by foolishness, or by any other means, didn't matter how he fell, didn't matter how he came to this great poverty, and he sold his land to another, and at last sold himself to a stranger, the Lord God made a way for him to be redeemed. This picture certainly gives us a picture of the sin and fall of our father Adam. Adam who sold himself and all humanity into bondage and death and sin. When he, by his transgression, we transgressed. When he, by his sin, we sinned. When he, by his rebellion, we rebelled. We all died in Adam, for we all sinned in Adam, and we all came under condemnation in Adam. We lost everything in him, Adam. Oh, what a fall. What a fall. That man, Adam, created in the image and likeness of God, is brought to sin and death and helplessness. That man who was made ruler over all God's creation is now made to suffer everything in God's creation. When this happened, God made a provision for redemption. Verse 48 says, After that he is sold, he may be redeemed. This is after the fact. This verse also states the possibility in these words, he may be redeemed. Just as our God gave his law in Israel before anyone needed it, our great God found a way of ransom for us before ever we fell in our father Adam. I want you to read carefully the article in today's bulletin on limited atonement. Keep it. Make sure you understand it. We need to recognize that God's work of grace for us was not some kind of an afterthought with God. It was not some kind of a reaction by God. God doesn't react to things. God acts. The things that God does that appear to be reactions are things that God purposed from eternity. And our redemption, our salvation, in Jesus Christ was that which God decreed from eternity. Indeed, it is that for which he made the world. God made this universe so that he might display his glory in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, that he might make himself known the glorious Lord God. And all the work that he does in time was accomplished for us from eternity. Let's look one more time in this very familiar text in Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. In Hebrews 4, the apostle tells us the works were finished from the foundation of the world. That's just about as plain as it can get. I received yesterday in the mail uh, some pamphlets from a fellow I've known for many, many years. And I was saddened to receive them because it takes to task the idea of absolute predestination. He was raised to know better. He was taught better. He wants to profess better. But he's taking it to task. Particularly men take to task the matter of eternal salvation, eternal redemption. The book of God states it plainly. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. We know. We know. We who are born of God know. We who are taught of God know. We who know what this book teaches know. 
We know that all things, all things, I wonder what that includes. I'll let you in a little secret. It probably includes all things. All things. But what? Yeah, that too. But what? That too. All things work together. Not individually, not isolated, but together. Like a great piece of machinery. All things work together for good. Not for everybody. I never dreamed it, never thought it, never said it. But for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. These are the redeemed. For whom he did foreknow. And that word foreknow doesn't refer to God foreknowing things. It's never used with reference to God foreknowing things. It's whom he did foreknow. It's not talking about God's omniscience. Omniscience is an attribute of God. It's talking about God's foreknowledge. That's an act of God. The word might better be translated, whom he did love beforehand. That's what it's talking about. Whom he loved with an everlasting love. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That he, the Lord Jesus Christ, might be the firstborn, the preeminent one among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. At the very time, indeed time is the wrong word, because we're talking about eternity. Before the world began, before time was marked out, when no one existed except God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, God loved the people. And those people he loved, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And having predestined them to be so, having willed it, God accomplished it. They were called, and they were justified, and they were sanctified, and they were glorified in Christ before the world began. And now, in his wise and good providence, this is what God's doing. He's bringing those people he loved from everlasting into the blessed union of life and faith with his son in the knowledge of his son. Every war that's ever been fought by greedy men over money, power, and land. And sadly, when you get right down to it, I can't think of any war that was ever fought except over money, power, and land. Isn't that sad? Isn't that, isn't that a sad commentary on our race? But every war that's ever been fought, every calamity that's ever come to pass, every sickness, every disease, every plague, every death, every nation God has raised up, every nation God has put down is but for one purpose, the saving of God's elect. That's God's providence. He works all things to accomplish this, which he from eternity predestined. The words back here in our text, redeemed again, speak of getting something back that has been lost. Speaks of getting something back that uh, you once possessed. It's uh, the word we would use if we went to a pawn shop with a redeeming ticket and redeemed something we pawned last week. We were his. We belonged to God before we fell. We belonged to Christ from eternity. Those who were redeemed, now listen carefully, those who were redeemed, all of them were Israelites. The law of redemption didn't apply to anybody else. The kinsman redeemer, this law was not given to anybody else. The redeemed ones were chosen covenant people, God's elect. So it is with Christ our Lord. The redeemed ones were redeemed because God made a covenant, a covenant with Abraham. And that covenant with Abraham represented a covenant, 
a covenant made with God's own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, before the world was to redeem and save his people, the sons and daughters of Abraham. All right, that's the redeemed. Second, this chapter speaks of the Redeemer, and this is both the best and the most important part of the chapter. The nearest kinsman had the responsibility of redeeming his brother and his brother's lost property. If a person was forced into slavery, his Redeemer purchased his freedom. When debt threatened to overwhelm a man, the kinsman stepped in to redeem his homestead and preserve his family. If a family member died without an heir, without a son, the kinsman gave his brother a name that lived on by marrying his widow, his brother's widow, and raising up a son to his brother. The law was given in the book of Deuteronomy. It is very plain that if you've got a brother and your brother dies and has no child or has no son, then you marry his wife and you raise up seed to your brother in your brother's name. We have a picture of this in uh, Judah uh, giving Tamar to Onan. And uh, we have a picture of it in Ruth chapters 3 and 4. Uh, Naomi uh, told Ruth when they came back to Bethlehem, Judah, her husband Elimelech had died and left her a widow. Ruth's husband Elimelech's son had died and left her a widow. And they came back to Bethlehem, Judah in abject poverty, helpless, broken. And Naomi told Ruth back in, Beth, back in uh, Moab about a kinsman. She said, she said, there is in Bethlehem, Judah, a kinsman. And God gave a law about kinsmen. There's a kinsman who, who has the ability, has the might, has the power, has the right, has the money to redeem what Elimelech in his foolishness lost. To redeem our state. And uh, she told her about the kinsman. They had other kinsmen besides Boaz. But she tells her about this kinsman. This kinsman redeemer. And Ruth follows Naomi back to Bethlehem Judah. And when they get into Bethlehem Judah, Ruth says, let me go glean in the fields today. This is the time of barley harvest. And so the people went out to glean the poor gleaning behind the re reapers. And Ruth, her hap was to light on the field that belonged to Boaz. And Boaz came and uh, he spotted Ruth. And he left some handfuls of purpose. And he said to Ruth, said, you join me for lunch today. And he, he flirted with Ruth. He courted her. And he saw to it that the men took care of her and let no one harm her. She said, if you're thirsty, you come get water they drew for you. I said, they do this for you. And then uh, Naomi, when Ruth came home with that sack full of barley, just all she could carry, she said, honey, where'd you get that? She said, I was out gleaning and uh, came in the field of a man by the name of Boaz, and this is what he left me. And Naomi said, oh, bless God. <laughs> the, man, the man's near kinsman. There's hope for us. The man's near kinsman. He, he, he might redeem us. And uh, she said, now Ruth, let me tell you what you do. Get to chapter 3. She said, uh, tonight Boaz will be laying in the tent to take his rest. And when he's finished reaping and finished eating and finished drinking, you watch where he lays, you mark the spot. And you go in and lay down beside him and do what he tells you to do. And Ruth slipped in there well after dark and uh, she laid down beside Boaz, snuggled up close to him, and Boaz felt something, he's scared. He turned around, woman, what are you doing here? She said, I'm your handmaid. Spread your skirt over me. Take me for your wife. You're my kinsman. Now, Ruth didn't have but one thing. She didn't have but one thing. 
Just one thing. You know what she had? Boaz said to Ruth when he first met her, he said, I know who you are. I've heard about you. Everybody in town knows you're a virtuous woman. All she had was her good name. The only thing that set her apart from anybody else was her good name. She, was, she had stayed with Naomi. She followed Naomi, a virtuous woman. Bernita was asking me about this this morning or talking to him about it. They said, I'd, I always wonder what, what, what is this? I know there's nothing untoward concerning this. What is it? No, Ruth. Ruth didn't do anything evil. Boaz didn't do anything evil. But it certainly would appear so to anybody who saw it. And Boaz said to Ruth, she, he said, to, he said, no, you, you get on out of here. Don't let anybody see you. And uh, I'll do everything you need. I'll meet your every need. Now this is what I'm telling you. This is what Ruth is telling you. This is what this law is telling you. There's only one way that you find an interest in our kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus. You got to give up everything. You got to give up everything. Everything. Sacrifice everything. Come to him with nothing. Most of us are proud of our names. We like our good name. Shelby and I were watching a, a Matt Dillon last night before we went to bed late. And uh, a fellow sent his son away from home and some of a thief and robber. He said, uh, uh, this is our name, been a good name. Nobody speaks ill of this name. And we're proud of our name. You come to Christ with nothing. There's no goodness in you. No goodness about you. There's nothing in you to distinguish you from any vile wretch in hell today. Nothing. And you'll come to Christ that way or you won't come at all. You come bowing to him. Confessing your sin. Giving up every claim to righteousness. Bowing to him as Lord. And uh, Boaz told Ruth, said, I'll, I will be your kinsman, redeemer. But there's a kinsman nearer you. He's going to be dealt with first. And Boaz came to that nearer kinsman the next day in chapter 4. And he said, uh, Elimelech died down in Moab. And his wife, Naomi, has come back and said, uh, I thought I would advertise it to you. So if you want to, you can buy back Elimelech's inheritance. You can redeem her. He said, well, I'll take that. But Boaz said, uh, there's a catch. You got to take Ruth. You got to take that Moabite's woman. You got to marry her too. And the man said, no, oh, I can't do that. That would mar my inheritance. The Limelech's boy, he's older than my boy. He'd be the firstborn. My boy would lose everything. Oh, no, 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 no. You can have them if you want them. I don't want them. I don't want them. So it is with our blessed Savior. Before he could have us, he must deal with the law. The law of God must be satisfied. Justice must be satisfied. And Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. When death came at the hands of another man, the Redeemer acted also as the avenger of blood and pursued the killer. He pursued him with vengeance. It was required in the book of God. The word translated redeemer is the very same word that's commonly translated avenger. Where God gave the law concerning the cities of refuge, the avenger of blood, he's the kinsman redeemer. This word is used throughout the Old Testament by the Lord God to describe himself as our redeemer. The implication is clear. He who is our kinsman redeemer, our true kinsman redeemer, is himself God our Savior. Let's look at a few of them. Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. We're going to read the scriptures. Uh, 
who is my Savior? Who is your Savior? Who is my Redeemer? Who is your Redeemer? Exodus 6, 6. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you. I'll redeem you with a stretched out arm by might, and I'll redeem you with great judgments by justice. Book of Job, Job chapter 25. Now Job 25, I'm sorry, chapter 19 and verse 25. Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. It is God who redeemeth thy life from destruction, the psalmist tells us. The Lord God says, Fear not, thou worm, Jacob. Ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Look at Isaiah 41, 43 rather, verse 1. Isaiah 43, verse 1. What a blessed solace for our souls to know our Redeemer. Now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob. He that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have redeemed thee. God's redeemed are his elect, his covenant people. A people who have no reason ever to be afraid. A people who have no reason ever to be afraid. <laughs> what do you suppose God is going to allow to touch you? He gave his son for you. Who do you think is going to harm you? God gave his son for you. Who do you think is going to injure you? God gave his son for you. Look at Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am first and I am last. Beside me there is no God. And verse 22. He says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. The Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. But even God himself could not be our redeemer except to become our kinsman. And that's exactly what our Savior did. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16. Hebrews 2, 16. When Christ came into the world, God became our kinsman. Hebrews 2.16 For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Why? That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Brother Lynch is talking to us this morning about the priesthood. The Lord Jesus was behooved. It was necessary for him. If he would save us to become one of us that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest to make reconciliation for our sins. When Christ was born at Bethlehem, his birth was different from that of any other man. You begin reading the first chapter of Matthew, and you read that so-and-so begat so-and-so and begat so-and-so, until you get down to verse 18. And then in verse 18, there's a change. There the book of God says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Our Lord Jesus 
is that one who breaks his mother's womb in birth. He's called the firstborn. The firstborn. He is the only child ever to break his mother's womb in birth. The womb is broken in conception, not in birth. Except here. Here, God created a man in the womb of a virgin. And the firstborn breaks the womb in birth. He is our kinsman redeemer. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God became one of us. What's required of the kinsman? How can a man redeem another man? How can the kinsman redeemer be our kinsman redeemer? Well, obviously, he must be near kin. He must also be able to redeem. That means he must be free of calamity and not need redemption himself. He must be willing to redeem. He's not required to. He just must be willing. And if you're going to redeem, you've got to pay the price. Whatever the price is, you've got to pay it. Redemption was completed only when the payment was made completely. Only when the law was fully satisfied with the payment made. Measuring things according to the year of Jubilee, if that drew near. And the man was required, if he didn't redeem, to bear the shame of it permanently. The near kinsman, he wasn't forced to redeem, but if he didn't redeem, it was a custom in Israel that he'd take his shoe off. And he would be the man with the loose shoe. As took place in Ruth chapter 4. Our Lord Jesus Christ, our kinsman redeemer, will never bear shame or reproach. For he shall not lose one for whom he suffered and died. He shall not fail, but rather he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He who satisfied the justice of God shall be satisfied by the justice of God for the law itself demands that his redeemed ones go free. Christ had the right to redeem us because he's our near kinsman through the incarnation. He is that one that uh, cannot be touched, or that, that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Uh, one who was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. The Lord Jesus has power to redeem because he's God. His, his work is the work of the infinite God. His sacrifice is of infinite worth and of infinite merit. Our Lord Jesus Christ, blessed be his name, is willing to redeem. He said, uh, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Christ demonstrated his willingness to redeem sinners. When he went to Calvary and died in our stead. He's willing to save sinners. He's willing to save sinners. Oh, oh would to God I could, could convince everybody who hears my voice. Christ is willing to save sinners. Far more willing to save than any sinner is willing to be saved. He is a willing Savior. He delighteth in mercy. The Son of God paid the price. Justice demanded the life of one without sin. Justice demanded the life of one who was perfect. Justice demanded the life of one who was holy. But justice could not take his life except he be made sin. And so he who knew no sin was by the hand of God made sin. For us, 
that we by the hand of God in justice might be made the righteousness of God in him more than that our blessed Savior effectually accomplished it he with his own blood entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us so I bid you come to Christ come to Christ like Ruth came to Boaz lay down at his feet bid him spread his skirt over you and take you for his own preacher do you reckon he'd take me I'm here to tell you something and I tell you this with no hesitancy at all you come to Christ like Ruth came to Boaz bid him take you and he will rejoice to take you this man receiveth sinners and eats with them Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners don't miss this Christ who is our redeemer our kinsman redeemer is also our avenger of blood he is that one who as the avenger of blood pursues the guilty and pursues them and pursues them and he keeps pursuing them until it chases them right into the city of refuge <laughs> and, and he is the city of refuge and there's no possibility of danger because as long as the priest is alive the one in the city of refuge is safe how can that be what's that got to do with this turn back to Isaiah Isaiah chapter 61 I'll show you Isaiah 61 Christ is the avenger of blood he chases the guilty one and chases him into the city of refuge he's the city of refuge and he is the high priest who guarantees the life of that man who's in that city Isaiah 61 verse 1 the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of jubilee, the day of atonement, and the day of vengeance of our God. What? Vengeance? Christ's death is the proclamation of the vengeance of God vengeance fully satisfied to comfort all that mourn Christ Jesus our great high priest by the sacrifice of himself has avenged the guilt of his people has avenged in the fury of God's wrath all that was against us He's avenged the honor of God. He restored that which, we, which he took not away. But one more question. In Leviticus 25, the kinsman redeemer, we're told, uh, must be able to redeem. He must be able to redeem. We're told in Psalm 49 that the man cannot redeem himself none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for his soul but Christ did how is it that he's able to redeem he who is God the infinite holy God the Lamb of God becomes one of us and when he became one of us he at last was made to be sin for us all the sins of God's elect were laid to his charge that can't be right that cannot be right that's not legal that's not lawful that's not just you cannot charge him with sin that's exactly so you can't do that 
except he be made sin. And he who was made sin for us now, now has all the sins of God's elect made his. Our guiltiness made his guiltiness. God's judgment against our sin made his judgment. And he dies under the wrath of God. John Trapp commenting on the 40th Psalm made this observation. He said, our Lord Jesus Christ was maximum pectorum, the greatest of sinners. For our sins, which he here calleth his, he suffered. And here his bitter agony in the garden is graphically described. Neither is it absurd to say that as he bore our sins in his own body upon the tree, he was first redeemed by himself and afterwards we. He was first redeemed by himself and afterwards we. Back in the book of Leviticus chapter 16, on the day of atonement, Aaron was required to make sacrifice first for his own sin, then for the people's. Why? Why? Aaron's sins, their sins were the same. He was one of the Israelites. Why was he required in that type to make sacrifice first for his own sin and then for the people's? Because Christ Jesus, who would fulfill the picture, must be made sin for us. And he needs not offering sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. This he did once when he offered himself as our sacrifice for sin. Naomi's friends give us a fitting reminder of God's purpose of grace. When the women heard what had happened, the Lord had given Naomi a son, they said, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name might be famous in Israel. That's what Christ has done as our kinsman redeemer. He has satisfied justice. He has restored what we lost, what he took not away with the overplus. He's made us his own. He's blotted out our transgressions, forgiven us our sins, made us the righteousness of God in him, married us to himself that his name might be famous in Israel. That his name might be famous in Israel. Let us ever proclaim his name and his praises with his name who loved us and gave himself for us. Our mighty kinsman redeemer. Amen.